Hey animal enthusiasts and pet hobbyists, it's Joelle here, and today I'm going to be going over how to care for some non-photosynthetic invertebrates, primarily feather dusters, and what I wish I knew before getting them. Let's get into it. Keeping non-photosynthetic reef invertebrates is often regarded as expert-only due to their high maintenance and requirements, which is unfortunate because they are also some of the most colorful and beautiful organisms found in the reef. Although they may seem difficult to care for, there are many steps you can take to successfully increase longevity and survival rate. I want to go over feather dusters first, since they seem to be more common in the aquarium trade, and there is often misinformation on them. There are many different types of feather dusters, but those most commonly found in reef tanks are of the genus Sebalostarte, Protula, Bispira, Spirobranchus, Anamobia, and Pomatostegus. Most ornamental feather dusters that can be purchased from the local fish store are in the family Sebelidae, which includes genus Sebalostarte. These are considered true feather dusters and are characterized with having a soft tube consisting of secreted mucus and sediments and are often called parchment-like in consistency. They range in many different sizes in terms of length and how long they build their tubes, but most I've seen stay around the 5 inch mark. However, they can be purchased at much smaller or larger sizes. Like most other reef organisms, water parameters should be roughly the same with a temperature between 72 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 8 to 12 carbonate hardness, pH 8.1 to 8.4, salinity 1.023 to 1.026 specific gravity, and undetectable levels of ammonia and nitrite. Supplements will include trace elements which are present in most salt mixes, and although they can use calcium, specific levels aren't as important as those for hard tube worms which we will get into later. The area that is often misunderstood is regarding the diet of the feather dusters. When I first got them, I was feeding preserved phytoplankton that could be purchased off the shelf of your local fish store. With this, they appear to be thriving up until around the 5 or 6 month mark when they shed their crown out of nowhere. After about another month, they will regrow their crown at a much smaller size. Lastly, after about another 5 or 6 months, the worm will shed its final crown and eventually perish. This same unfortunate process happened to all of my feather duster worms, and because of this, I went to do more research on a more professional level. In a research study by Clyde Tamaru and others in 2011, they conducted an experiment on the growth and survival of juvenile feather duster worms being fed live and preserved algae. They used five groups of worms in the genus Sebalostarte, one control being fed raw seawater to mimic natural food concentrations, a group fed live isochrysis, another group fed preserved isochrysis, another fed live nanochloropsis, and lastly, a group fed preserved nanochloropsis. The algal sizes for both preserved and live phytoplankton range between 2 to 4 and 4 to 7 micrometers. What the scientists found is that the feather dusters being fed live and preserved isochrysis had the highest survival rates with live nanochloropsis being not far behind. Preserved nanochloropsis, however, had a significantly lower survival rate. What this tells us is that most dead or preserved phytoplankton found on the shelf that has a base of nanochloropsis is likely useless by our large ornamental feather dusters. So how can we offer optimal nutrition to prevent our feather dusters from starvation? By feeding only live. Unfortunately, isochrysis is not as readily available from vendors and mainly purchased from universities or other science research supply institutions. However, live nanochloropsis starting culture can be found being sold more frequently by reefing vendors. Starting and keeping a phytoplankton culture isn't particularly difficult to care for, but making sure you keep everything sanitized and prevent contamination are most important. There are many other YouTube videos out there that show how to set up a simple culture, but if you'd like me to make a video on my methods, let me know in the comments. And here is Mikan eating his mouse in the background. But yeah, the materials list pretty much includes a sanitized bottle, airline tubing, air pump, a strong light source, some sanitized pipettes, live phytoplankton, and some F2 fertilizer. Other materials might include a drill to create holes, and a check valve for back siphon safety. When feeding, I like to pour out a portion into a feeding cup. Sometimes I keep the phytoplankton and other frozen food separate to prevent the fish from trying to steal or nip at the invertebrates. Then, I like to use a turkey baster to collect half of the cup and target feed the feather dusters with the flow on to entice them into feeding. I usually do this for about a minute before I turn off the pumps.
Then, with the pumps off, I target feed the remainder of the phyto that was left in the cup. It's important to turn off any UV sterilizers and protein skimmers while feeding, since these will kill and remove phytoplankton. I usually leave the pumps off for about 10 to 15 minutes before turning the flow back on again. Most phytoplankton cell sizes are so small that they will not be removed by things like filter socks or sponges. For some worms, like cocoa worms, you will see them curling their radials to bring in and filter the phytoplankton particles into their mouth. If you have other feather dusters like mine that immediately retreats when you target feed, I like to just pour the phyto in the area of high flow so that it will eventually reach the crown. You can also use the turkey baster at a distance as long as the flow permits it. Unlike dead phytoplankton that will pollute your tank if you overfeed, live phytoplankton will help reduce nitrate and phosphate levels and will compete with other nuisance algaes. Most feather dusters will readily accept live nanochloropsis, but if you aren't sure what genus of feather duster you have, it's best to offer a variety of live phytoplankton such as Tetrosalmus, Isochrysis, Thalassiosira, and others just to ensure the cell sizes and nutritional values are met. This will stop the worm from decreasing its crown size and prevent eventual starvation. A good indication that your worm is eating is the frequent release of excess waste, also known as poop. Some other indications of having a stable population of phytoplankton are the frequent appearance and long-term lifespan of sponges, filter-feeding bivalves, barnacles, spiroorbid worms, and other hitchhiking feather dusters. Much of the hitchhiker feather dusters are in the family Serpulidae, which are also known as hard tube worms. These worms form calcareous tubes and include the hard tube cocoa worm and Christmas tree tube worms. Because their tubes are made of calcium carbonate, Similar to stony corals, you should push for calcium levels to be around 400 to 450 parts per million, and magnesium 1200 to 1400 parts per million. Another characteristic of these worms is that they often have an operculum that they can use to block their tube entrance. Many reefers have been able to keep hitchhiker feather dusters long term and get them to reproduce without feeding live phytoplankton solely by providing what they feed their corals and fish. This is most likely because of their smaller size and lower energy requirements. When it comes to placement, many reefers like to place them on the bottom to middle section. Often, the soft tube worms will bury themselves in the sand, while others can be placed in rock crevices and will attach themselves. Hard tube worms, like cocoa tube worms, prefer to be under rock crevices in low light areas. They should be placed in a moderate flow area away from direct high flow, but enough to have food brought to them. If the flow is too high, they are stressed out, or simply don't like their location, they might leave their tube in search of a new area to create a new tube. Outside the tube, they are vulnerable to predation by other animals such as arrow crabs, worm-eating wrasses, and butterfly fish. They may also shed their crown if they are too stressed out. Another behavior I have yet to determine the reason for is the shriveling of the crown. Specifically cocoa worms, there are times where out of nowhere they will curl up all the radials so the crown looks deformed. Some reefers believe it could be due to stress from the flow, or if there is a water parameter imbalance, or if it's a feeding response. The longest my worm has ever been like this was 4 days, before returning to normal. Other important information is that you should never use coral dips on these guys as it could potentially kill them, and you should acclimate through drip acclimation like other sensitive inverts. But yeah guys, that is essentially everything you need to know about feather dusters. I made this video in hopes I could help and prevent anyone from making the same mistakes I did and we could better keep these guys long term. Hopefully more research can go into these guys so we can better improve their health and be more sustainable in the aquarium hobby. If you have any other questions or want to see more, let me know in the comments and if you like this video, please make sure to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.